When The Little Mermaid came out in 1989, it was an enormous success, coming at a time when Disney's animation department really needed a hit. Thus, it was no surprise when in 1992, an animated series premiered on CBS. A lot of us probably remember the series as it had several VHS compilations released, and was rerun on the Disney Channel and Toon Disney for a long time. But did you know that there was actually a series planned before the animated one? In 1989, Jim Henson was in talks with partnering up with Disney. He had a lot of great ideas for theme park attractions, many of which never got made due to his unfortunate and untimely death in 1991. One non-theme park idea was for a live-action Little Mermaid series. The two episodes ended up getting filmed, but never officially released. Eventually, they leak their way online, which is what I'm going to be reviewing here. I give you Little Mermaid's Island. The show was done with a mix of puppets and live actors. The puppets look amazing, and are easily the best part of the show. The first episode that was filmed was called Sebastian's Birthday, and it was yet another one of those surprise party plots where the main character thinks everyone's forgotten about them. I think every kid's show has to have one of these, it's like a prerequisite. Even when I was in the target audience for these kinds of shows, I got really sick of this plotline. The episode opens with it, obviously, being Sebastian's birthday. Sebastian, voiced again by Samuel E. Wright, is talking to Scuttle, voiced again by Buddy Hackett, though Scuttle mishears the word birthday as bird day and goes along oblivious as always. Bird day! Bird day! Well, it's about time! Sebastian next runs into Flotsman Jetsam, who suggests that his friends aren't as caring as he thinks. The evil eels here don't have a confirmed voice actor that I can find, but they sound just like Patty Edwards who voiced in the movie. I wouldn't be surprised if it was her. Ariel, meanwhile, is putting together a present for the crab with the help of her best friend Flounder and his, um, sister. Sandy. Yeah, he apparently has a sister. I must have missed that scene in the movie. Of course, they play dumb to Sebastian, who leaves dejectedly, where he is mocked again by the eels. So, your friends are too busy to see you. Ariel, by the way, is portrayed by actress Marietta De Prima, making this one of the rare times that The Little Mermaid has not been performed by Jodie Benson. I can't find direct confirmation on who voiced Flounder and Sandy, but several sites list voice actress Veronica Taylor in the role, who is best known for being the first English voice of Pokemon's Ash Ketchum. Sebastian goes to visit his good friend Scales the Dragon next. You know, I watched The Little Mermaid many times over the years, and I don't remember any scenes with a friendly cave-dwelling dragon. I must have really tuned out some parts or something. Scales is blowing up balloons for Sebastian, and covers up the noise of them popping, on his, uh, scales, with a rock number. He's voiced by the legendary Jim Cummings, who's been in just about everything animated since the 1980s. Dejected, Sebastian visits Grimsby next. You may remember Grimsby was Prince Eric's advisor slash guardian, who dismissed mermaids as nautical nonsense. In this series, however, Grimsby is a friendly sea captain who sails around with Max the dog, and regularly hangs out with Ariel and friends. No mention of Eric is ever made. Grimsby is played by Clive Revel, who had an extensive stage and screen career, including voicing Emperor Palpatine in the original cut of The Empire Strikes Back. If Max looks familiar, it's because the puppet they used here was first used as Ambrosius in Labyrinth. Of course, the plot plays out exactly how you'd expect. Sebastian gets sadder and sadder until his friends spring the surprise on him, and all is well. This half-hour episode has a whopping five songs, not counting the intro and ending themes, and two reprises. While the songs are pretty good, it feels rather excessive. The next episode was called Tell the Truth. Flounder fools around in Ariel's grotto, knocking over some of her stuff. After she reprimands him and leaves, the eels swim in and coax Flounder into showing them Ariel's special pearls, against Sandy's wishes. Flounder ends up spilling the pearls everywhere. The eels convince the fish to lie about what happened, before discreetly making off with two of the bigger pearls. Remember, just the little fish. The eels end up fighting over the pearls, which Ariel claims, oblivious to their mischief. In the end, Flounder and Sandy fess up to what really happened, learning the episode's very valuable lesson. Unlike the animated Little Mermaid series, this show was clearly aimed at a strictly preschool audience, which doesn't make it bad in any way, but it certainly would have made it less accessible to slightly older fans. You've probably noticed a few key characters are missing. As I mentioned, there's no Prince Eric. Ariel's sisters and King Triton are also nowhere to be found, although this version of Ariel seems more mature than her impulsive movie counterpart, so perhaps the other merfolk were deemed superfluous. The most notable character who doesn't appear is Ursula herself, with her eels filling in the gap. I can only guess that the creators were afraid Ursula would come off as too harsh or scary for kids, which is a shame because I'd love to see how they would have pulled off the sea witch here. 
Despite having the Muppet Studio build puppets for them and having Ed Christie, a puppet designer and supervisor, come to watch over things, according to Muppet archivist Karen Falk, there wasn't a lot of involvement from the Henson people otherwise. In fact, she mentioned Jim was apparently disappointed by what he saw. There's no real confirmation on why the show fell through. It really could have been a number of things. But ultimately, I don't think we missed out on much, based on the two episodes here. They're not bad, but the animated show was so much better. Not to mention, better for all ages as opposed to just one demographic. Plus, both Henson and Disney had done better kid shows by that point, and while Mermaid's Island wasn't necessarily bad, it still paled in comparison to what we already had. Ultimately, the episodes are a strange little novelty, but not much else. Still, it's always interesting to look at what could have been in Disney and Muppet history. As an afternote, a few Little Mermaid books were published around the time, clearly meant to tie into the unaired Island series. Sandy the Fish and Scales the Dragon appear prominently in them, most likely leading to the kids that own the books wondering who the heck these characters were. If you like this video, please let me know. Also, if you own the tie-in books and just now learned who Sandy and Scales were, definitely leave a comment. Till next time! Take it from me from under the sea, music is in